Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm John Samet, the Dean of the uh, Colorado School of Public Health, and uh, welcome to uh, today's presentation um, in the Dean's uh, speaker series. I'm delighted to um, introduce our speaker coming to us from uh, Spain today, uh, Maria Sigi Gomez, who is a physician uh, and a public health researcher and a practitioner with degrees from the University of Barcelona, School of Medicine, and I guess now the Harvard T.H. Chan School of uh, Public Health. I first met Maria uh, when uh, she was at Johns Hopkins, uh, where she was a faculty member working in the uh, Injury Control and uh, Research Center. She's had a remarkable course uh, in her career of being a, an academic, a faculty member in Spain, uh, directing uh, the European Center for Injury Prevention, uh, serving in uh, government, uh, most no notably as a general director for traffic for Spain for 2012 through 2016, where her mission was to uh, improve uh, road uh, safety, a critical global um, issues. She's had a productive career as a uh, scholar and uh, had impact uh, through her scholarship, but also globally through her work on injury prevention. Uh, currently, she works as an international uh, consultant uh, for the Federation Internationale de l'Automobile, better known as FIA or FIA, I guess, which does auto racing events among other things, but is also interested in uh, reducing the burden of uh, roads, uh, road related uh, injury. Uh, so I'm delighted that uh, Maria is here with us uh, today. Her presentation is entitled Revising Our Strategies in Road Safety. Looking forward to the second uh, decade of action. So Maria, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks to you, John, for this very kind introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to speak at your Dean's Speaker Series, which has had such interesting individuals like Al Sommer, who was the Dean at Johns Hopkins when we were both there. The purpose of my talk is to challenge uh, your audience uh, into an otherwise corner public health problem. I should not have included road safety in the title of the presentation, as this by itself might have had an impact in gathering uh, fewer attendees, uh, such is life. Uh, and the challenge is for all of us public health professionals to realize that this is an extraordinary legitimate public health problem to which they can contribute from many standpoints, both professionally and personally, and to do so in a slightly different way that they might have currently uh, believe they should. Uh, most of us have heard so many times that road crashes and their ill consequences are 90% due to human error that is best corrected with inordinate amounts of enforcement that we have turned this topic into a somewhat dull and unattractive one. I certainly look forward to your comments during the question and answer period that we have in the program, but for now, for now let me carry straight into... Um, into uh, let me see how I change my slide because you're seeing the same slide still, aren't you? Yes. You're still seeing my title slide, aren't you? Yes. Yes, this, uh, this is despite me moving. Wait a moment, we have a technicality here. How Ms. do Ms. I move? Try going up to the top on the left and say, where it says use slideshow, do you see that? Yeah, yeah, yes, slideshow. Hit that um, and that should correct things. Uh, from current slide, resume slideshow. And if I click next, here, here you are. So let me go then and uh, uh, introduce you with the outline of my points today. A quick review on where we are, uh, what happened uh, for the first decade of action. What are the goals? What's the strategy and a proposed strategy? Where are we? Well, we are in a relatively bad place uh, because as you can see uh, uh, on the graph, we are dealing with a problem that is killing about 2% of all death, all people worldwide. That is the 12th biggest cause of death or the 12th biggest squared on this graph. 
clearly we are not fighting ischemic heart conditions, which represent 16% of all fatal victims worldwide, but we are dealing with a problem larger than the deaths related to HIV or malaria, and about the same magnitude as the deaths related to tuberculosis, very traditional public health problems. Besides that, there are estimated 50 million non-fatal victims every year, which plays road crashes as the seventh leading cause of disability adjusted life years. And altogether, it is estimated that between two and 3% of gross domestic product worldwide is lost in relation to crashes. To put this monetary burden into a US perspective, let me share with you, again, this is going to be a problem because you don't see the map. Let me share with you a map that reflects that the US is actually bearing most of the cost of this. Uh, I do apologize, this has never happened before. What I see on one screen is different from what you see in the other screen. You, you, Marie, you there might you are, that's a map, that's a map, okay? So in the map, you can see that the US is actually bearing most of these economic laws worldwide, and, and this is in relation to the different um, lifestyle and the cost of living in, in different countries. Uh, these two point, uh, uh, these two percent of deaths worldwide um, are actually 1.3 million deaths as per last count of the World Health Organization. And in the map, you have in darker blue countries with fewer absolute number of road deaths and in rather uh, countries with more deaths. And as you can see in this graph, it is China and India leading the way by far. And most of the countries having some reasonable amount of deaths that they need to address. But if you prefer rates better than um, uh, um, absolute numbers. Here you have the graph. Um, the average in the world is 15 deaths per 100,000 population. In darker blue countries with fewer rates, in darker red, more deaths. Uh, it might be worth to point out that the best performing country is Sweden with four per 100,000 population deaths. And the worst is Saudi Arabia with 60. Uh, in a general, Europe is uh, the, the, the safest region that it exists these days with 10 deaths per 100,000. And just so that you know, Spain, my home country, is currently at six per 100,000 deaths. Having said that, uh, it might be important to know that most of the victims are not actually occupants of four-wheel passenger vehicles, as many of you might have in mind. Actually, passengers and drivers of four-wheel vehicles represent less than one-third of that 1.3 million victims. Uh, anywhere between 34 in the case of the Americas and as low as 16% in the case of Southeast Asia, because all other victims are either pedestrians, cyclists, or power two- and three-wheeler users. And that presents a picture that is much more demanding of attention to all of us as we are actually killing vulnerable road users in a much larger proportion that we never uh, want to admit. And that is why uh, starting with 2009, when the first estimate of global burden of deaths from road crashes was performed, um, and a figure of 1.2 million was estimated, arguments were built that led to the establishment of this UN General Assembly approved Decade of Action 2010-2020, which aimed to uh, have the number of victims uh, by 2020. The, the, the trend in 2010 is what should look like a blue line, a straightforward from 125 upwards. Um, the green line is what the decade claim should happen, a halving on the number of deaths by 2020. The yellow line is that somewhere in the decade, the Sustainable Development Goals movement created Goal 3.6, calling for a halving of the death rates. And that is why, in the end, that should have taken us to a different endpoint. 
Um, and not surprisingly, reality shows that we are not here nor there. Reality is the red line as depicted in the last global status report published by WHO that quantifies that 1.3 million that I mentioned before. Now, in looking at these three, four lines, some people see the glass half filled and others see it half empty. We are not where the trend supposedly would have taken us. We are not where the decade should have taken us. We are, as I said, half the way through. Formally, we call this, as, as, uh, we call this an stagnation state. Um, luckily, um, IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics, uh, through the Global Burden of Disease Study, which you probably know well, allow us to go back beyond 2010, even farther earlier. And, 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 and the map on the right has the rate in change the, the, the change in the rate since 1990. It is in fact 1990 to 2019. And what you can see in darker blue are bigger improvements and in darker yellow, on the contrary, uh, worse uh, developments. Um, it, it is very sad to say that over that almost uh, 20 year span, the average change has been that of positive 0.2 percent. That that being the case, um, at least with the latest uh, data we have. Um, a resume a slideshow. I need to do this resume slideshow um, every so often. Forgive me for this. I was still in the U.S. when uh, CDC uh, published. It's 10 great public health achievements for the 20th century. And as you see on the screen, motor vehicle safety was rated as the second best performing uh, entity uh, for, for that period of time. Uh, so you might be a little bit surprised because you might have in your head that the US has been performing very well when it comes to metal vehicle safety. I have just shown you images that put the US slightly above the mean in the world and not much progress in, in, in past years. Let me just clarify that it is true that in the US road crashes are no longer number one uh, cause of death except for ages 15 to 24, but it is still the case that in the US uh, road crashes are one of the leading causes of death and disability as I was uh, mentioning uh, before. So yes, there was progress. There was progress in the US. Uh, much of this progress came after severe carnages that occurred in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And we are privileged to have Sue Baker watching and she is witness to the substantial changes that occur in the country when it came to improvements in infrastructure, improvements in vehicle design. But let me raise another type of change that happened in the US as well as in many other high income countries, which is not so good for our planet and for many other issues. Uh, that is to say that also during that time, we managed to shift modes of transportation. What you have is a graph that depicts the substantial drops in the percent of children that walk to a school back from the 1970s into 2010, not only in the US, but also in Australia, Canada, Brazil, the UK, or Switzerland as examples. That meaning, yes, there were substantial improvements. Yes, there was a removal of vulnerable road users or in many of the high income countries' roads. And yes, uh, progress has been made, although the question is whether it could have been made bigger and bolder. And the next graph comes to ratify my uh, challenge because uh, once, once, once plots uh, social demographic status with road uh, fatality rates per 100,000 population, you can see, as it's uh, often um, the case, that the poorer the countries, the more the road deaths, the richer the country, the fewer the deaths, but that's not necessarily a, in a linear shape, meaning even high income countries still have much room for improvement uh, in, in, in uh, curbing this pandemic, a true pandemic that is. 
Uh, so the decade has come to an end, is coming to an end in 15 days. Uh, and, and funny or ironically enough, we have still not addressed a number of issues. I won't labor over them. Some of them are of a technical nature. It relates to definitions of metrics. It relates to substantial underreporting of deaths in most countries. Some other unaddressed issues are strategic. Uh, when we agreed to have the deaths, why did we, did we, we never agreed to anything, but maybe we should have chosen a few countries and target our attention on those and leave the rest a little bit on their own. Maybe we should have targeted a number of interventions. We just kept trying to do everything all the time. And probably that is behind what uh, we see as, as the outcome. There are some other philosophical issues that I want to cover uh, 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 later in, in, in my presentation. Uh, and so uh, we are finishing, as I said, in 15 days. Uh, but what are our goals? Well, only in August, the UN General Assembly uh, voted for another UN resolution calling for an extension of the Sustainable Development Goal 3.6 up to 2030. Uh, this resolution is the consequence of the recommendation in the Declaration of Stockholm. Stockholm is the city where the third ministerial conference was held early this year in February before the world lockdown because of COVID. And ahead of that conference, a group of us had come together to develop some recommendations um, uh, for this second decade of action. What you have on the graph is then the update on the projections and the reality and where we should go by 2030 if we are true to the goals that have been uh, uh, put on, on to us. Uh, funny, I'm, I'm, I'm having to do all these different combinations of keys this time. Uh, this uh, this uh, UN resolution um, is very important, important and powerful because it takes us, it gives us the opportunity to fully connect with the deadline of most other sustainable development goals. And what you have on the uh, left of the screen is the four specific goals that are often most cited in relation to road uh, safety. Of course, this 3.6 I mentioned about having the number of deaths and injuries, but also uh, SDG 11. 1.2, which talks about providing access to safe and affordable and sustainable transport systems. Uh, but then uh, uh, goals in relation to encouragement of companies to adopt sustainable practices and also to promote a public procurement practices that are sustainable uh, in accordance to national policies. These being the four that are most directly mentioned in the literature out there, I want to call your attention that, in fact, when it refers to the SDG universe, the sky is the limit. Uh, whether you work to reduce uh, poverty or to reduce obesity and overweight, or whether to improve uh, the cleanliness of water in relation to pollution, I can assure you that there is a connection between your specific SDG and mobility and transport and safety. And therefore, the challenge is that after this talk, we all go back to our daily routines in thinking how can we insert road safety in our work to help uh, synergically move things um, ahead substantially. Because these SDG goals are uh, our goals for 2030, but we must keep in mind that there are longer term visions that are also pushing us in the direction of collaboration and synergies. There's a long term vision of zero, zero of wrong things. So we want zero injured, we want zero congestion, we want zero pollution, we want zero debt and a lot of competitive competitiveness. And this longer term vision has actually a due date for the European Union, that would be 2050. But this very vision has been fully embraced by the World Bank led sustainable mobility for all movement, uh, which 
um, uh, the, the difference is that it doesn't really have a due date, but it is there, and that means uh, a lot of move, a lot of things are happening at present time where we can come together and unite in the sake of securing our specific goals, regardless of the specific um, topic that we work on. Where are we is that despite this and despite these global goals and visions, we, we live in a rather messy situation uh, with messy competition. Let me for a minute talk about the messy competition within the traditional road safety community. What you have in uh, the slide is a picture to summarize the 12 specific targets, performance targets that have been developed to help reach the halving of the deaths objective. And it is 12 targets for each target. There might be one to three indicators. And, and these targets were developed following the most relevant advancement of the first decade, which was the framing of road safety as a matter of five pillars needing to work together. The pillar of management, the pillar of infrastructure, vehicles, behavior, individual behavior, and post-crash management. Many of you will recognize these pillars as a simple expansion of the more historically uh, known triad of person, vehicle, and road. Well, just come back to, to the performance indicators, you can see that the first two indicators relate to management, the next two indicators relate to infrastructure, the fifth and only indicator relates to vehicles, and then indicate uh, target six to 11 relate to behavior. Uh, with only one target uh, related to post-crash care. So intentionally or unintentionally, by creating these performance targets and their corresponding indicators, we have done three things at once. First, we have created the impression that everything is under control and this is a silo. And as we road safety people within these 12 actions will solve the problem. The second thing that we are saying is, yes, there are many things that are important, but some things are more important than others. Behavior is more important because we are devoting um, six indicators to, to the topic. And, 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 and the last thing that we are doing with this type of a scenario is that now we need to fight for resources to move along one versus the other. So we are creating competition between us. And that in itself is substantially damaging, as I will try to, um, to address in a moment, uh, particularly the fact that we are placing so much focus on human behavior, the six purple targets. Why do I say this? Because uh, truth is that during the first decade and before the decade and, and forever, the primary strategy we have used is that of victim blaming. Uh, victim blaming uh, that goes back to that 90% um, human error statement. Uh, victim blaming that is at the basis of all that governments, industry, manufacturing vehicles, companies building roads use as a perfect shield to hide behind. We are in a public health school, so this is the perfect set up for me to remind you or to make the analogy of this bl blaming victim strategy with that of the infamous phase, phrase of guns do not kill guns, people kill. <laughs> people, Lola, the statement is guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, let's blame the victim yet again. But somewhere, somewhere over the past decade, uh, particularly over the past decade, we public health uh, experts uh, working on the, on, on the topic forgot to remind our transportation and policy colleagues of uh, Rose's paradigm. And, and just to, 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 to bring uh, this argument to uh, closure, uh, let me agree with you that yes, indeed, a few people behave, behave very badly. They behave on the extreme. And those extreme behaviors on the right end on that 
curve on the graph uh, call the attention of everyone and they show up on the media and they set up and promote the establishment of strict laws, strict regulation and strict penalties. Yet, how many people do you know who drive 100 miles per hour? And even if you know anyone, that might be a very occasional behavior. Of course, those behaviors need to be stopped with enforcement and all that is required. Yet, truth is that most people do not misbehave that badly or intentionally. They, we just misbehave just a little, often just because. And it is the minuscule increases in risk multiplied by the millions of us, the million times we move around, that create the bulk of those 1.3 million deaths and the 50 million non-fatal injuries. And so the challenge is how to best move our mobility curves to the left on the graph. And that is the challenge. And that should be our obsession rather than that, rather than that of chasing the minority extremists our public health strategy is the same always. And yet again, I command you to bring it forward also for road safety. Uh, it is about changing the environment so that individuals behave more safely, even without thinking uh, that they are doing that. It's about easing the good behaviors. It's about easing the good mobility. Um, this change uh, from individual behavior to environment friendly uh, structures that allow for safer mobility is the one that is behind the concept of safe systems. Uh, but before I go there, let me just revert for a moment on another argument for the messy, the messy competition that I raised before uh, so that we can uh, conclude uh, the where we are uh, picture. Uh, this messiness, um, this messiness uh, is best exemplified by information only from the European Union, cannot find it from anywhere else in the world, comparing mobility modes and the risk, whether of death per 100 million person kilometer or per death per million person travel hours. Uh, road safety does not occur in a silo. It, it is currently an add-on to broader uh, concerns in relation to transportation and choosing your transportation mode is a, an important thing for you to think about. As you can see in the graph, uh, uh, there is an inherent risk in all transportation modes, but by far the safest way you can move within Europe is either by plane or by train. Definitely the lowest of all risks, regardless of the metric. And that is why I rank it as number one in the second column. But as we move to road transportation, you can tell that your risk increases by 27 times. And so the choice of how do I move is already an important choice. And the choice from transitioning between the train and the car, because it's so much more convenient, bears a heavy uh, burden on, on my own person when I make that choice. Yet, when you choose road, you can also choose which specific transportation mode you want to use. Um, as you can tell on the second part of the graph, uh, the safest thing you can do within transportation by road is to ride a bus or a coach. And even then, you'll be twice as likely to die as you were on the plane or the train. Of course, you could uh, take your car, and you will be 20 times more likely to die, or you could ride a motorbike and be almost 400 times more likely to die than when you chose the train uh, that I mentioned before. But, but if instead of a motorized vehicle, you really want to go green, or you really want to integrate into the current society, societal uh, behavioral changes that are helping us, encouraging us to bike or to walk, be mindful because actually your chance of dying as either a pedestrian or a bicyclist in Europe are anywhere between 154 and 182 times higher. And so, yes, let's talk about modality. Yes, let's plan that modalities improve 
so that that more sustainable transportation mode is not, as I said, almost 105 times more likely to kill you than your otherwise beautiful car in the garage. This is very important because it shows how unless we ingrain safety at the heart of our decision making in planning transportation modes and in planning our lives, safety will remain just an add on. Um, and, and, and for as long as we send you on the road on a bike with vehicles around you traveling at 40, 50, 60 kilometers per hour and with no helmet on your head, chances are that you will contribute to this statistic. Please note that all these comparisons are true for the European Union. And please keep in mind that the European Union is already the safest uh, region in the world when it comes to transportation. So I can only imagine how these risks change as you move to other, other locations. And I look forward to research to illustrate that uh, difference. So the strategy so far has been that of uh, bringing together as many people as possible to convince them on the magnitude of the problem, the need, the very important need for them to coordinate between them and to choose um, a particular uh, thing to do within their area of competence, and then to provide them with a multitude of well-intended to-do lists, just for the sake of uh, the presentation. Wear your belt, check your tires, advise to re you are advised to rest every two hours, set up an automatic speed enforcement system, and by the way, this will pay itself and generate continuous streams of income for your institution if you set it up. Uh, lower the speed limit, set up a unique call number, blah, 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 one thing, another, 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 list of two, two things that we could actually ironically embrace under the so-called Christmas tree model. There is an array of interventions and we all try to get our intervention into the tree. Uh, in the meantime, we have developed another industry, that of experts in road safety. Some of them, even with public health backgrounds, and uh, they come with one taste or another and they decorate your tree according to their taste. And, and yes, there is pun intended in this remark. And so let me get back to the 90% human um, uh, behavior quote and, and, and let me get to the point of if this is the case, should we continue to do the same thing time and again? Like we claim it is Einstein's, um, the author of that famous insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And much like I would like to share with you that apparently Einstein never said that, we cannot trace back who said it. Uh, uh, I still think it is a true statement. Whereas in contrast, the 90% human error blame is not true, uh, but we will also be never able to find out who was the first one to, who said it and everybody has decided to use it to, mer to make it a, a, a false uh, truth. So the proposed strategy, and we are getting to the heart of, to, to the end of, of, of the, 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 the ex, um, exposure time. Uh, let's pause for a moment because doing more of the same will not take us to an, any different place. Let's pause for a moment and let's go back to basics because it was Professor Gibson, uh, a Harvard epidemiologist uh, who back in 1949 set up a wonderful analogy between road injuries and infectious diseases. And two years later, uh, Professor Gibson uh, named the energy as the etiological agent to curve down. And by doing so, they really came down to four specific places where we could be acting on to curve down this problem. I, I contend that forgetting this analogy with infectious diseases and instead placing injury prevention and motor vehicle uh, injury prevention in the world of lifestyle and chronic conditions has in fact brought us much damage. So just for a second, let's, let's stay within this paradigm. Um, we have decades of research 
And, and already back in 2000, uh, there was this particular paper uh, whose main table you have summarized on the, on the slide uh, that evaluated an, an, a substantial number of risk factors um, and identified that summing up the effect of all of them, we could manage to explain up to 90% of the deaths. And, and just for the sake of explanation, I will focus on the deaths. More importantly, the five top risk factors were speed limits, uh, uh, not having enough passive safety within vehicles, being uh, vulnerable road users, not having enough good health care uh, to take care of you in case of a crash, and then there being obstacles on the road. And, and just these five risk factors amounted back then to already 55% of the variation in the probability of death, which is an important finding in itself and should have helped us focus much better from a long time, since a long time ago. This research has been replicated almost 20 years later. And, and what you have on the right is an, a different type of plot, but essentially, essentially a confirmation that is still this day, is still uh, with uh, um, all the evidence gathered to date, vehicle safety and infrastructure are in the beginning the most important things we should be focusing on. And yes, of course, uh, in this slide, they didn't care about post-crash care, but uh, that's only because of the nature of the report. And, and, and what I'm trying to say is that we have known for quite some time what is essential. We have known for quite some time what works. As I will try to prove now, we have known for quite some time what we do and doesn't work and still we fail to have the energy the will or the power to clean up stop doing what does not work what is not conclusive and focusing on what and why is that the case have we not read our papers have we not done our homework well i think that the primary reason we are not doing this is because we missed the opportunity to put safety as a non-negotiable principle at the heart of the transportation system development. What guided development of transportation systems early on was a speed, speed number one. And any student in any engineering infrastructure school will tell you that distance time, uh, <coughs> travel time was <coughs> the one parameter they really had to fit their designs to optimize the designs for. Freedom of movement, comfort, if not aesthetics, and of course, economic profits. Those four elements were at the heart of the uh, development of the transportation system. And for quite some time afterward, there was this misconception that crashes were the price to pay for economic development. Uh, in the absence of safety at the heart of the system, where we have arrived at is road safety as an add-on, road safety as the decoration in the tree. This is what we do to fix what is not address at the core. Uh, these principles that guided the development of the transportation system in the beginning uh, are the fundament for the misalignment of economic in incentives that we see today. Uh, the, in, in a way, as it has been written uh, in some places already, uh, our, the road transport system can be viewed as a game in which different stakeholders pass negative externalities to each other in an attempt to avoid the direct cost their ill-performing actions uh, produce. And you might wonder, what do I mean by ill externalities? And here you have a few examples. Uh, when road design is wrong, what the builder or the designer or the government paying for that road says is user drive carefully and know that we will be watching out for possible failures on your side. And to the vulnerable user, we recommend that he makes himself visible and we tell him to be careful because heavier and faster vehicles have preference in the, in the road we built. 
when we do the wrong vehicle design, we use the same strategy. We tell the driver to drive carefully. We are watching, we are monitoring, we are enforcing. And even if my country prevents circulation of unsafe vehicles, I can still manufacture and export them to those countries who have not approved better regulation. We, we do have insurance, although only in a few countries, uh, but all we do with insurance is allow them to cherry pick to make sure that they choose the clients that are good payers and good drivers who do not have costly claims. Maybe we could alter the economic alignment to ensure that insurance serves as the carrot for uh, better uh, mobility patterns. What do we do with governance? When governments fail to legislate, when governments fail to regulate, we do nothing. Because for most governments, this is a zero sum game. For as long as all costs are covered, governments don't care about who pays. Eventually, they actually are pleased that the end user is the one who pays. Because lobbies, uh, the corporates, and the, the corporates that build the manufacture, the vehicles and, and the roads and, 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 and all other big companies, put a lot of pressure on these governments to ensure that their cost, that the cost of their failures are, are passed on, on to others. So with that said, let me uh, uh, come to uh, um, uh, the, subjects, the suggested strategy. Um, we, I, 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 I suggest that we must focus and select a few interventions that are appropriately addressing the restoring of accountability and the elimination of those externalities. So it is not about doing lots of things in different places, and it's not about putting lots of decorations in the tree. It's about making sure that those big externalities that are going on get realigned so that everybody is accountable for their own responsibility. And yes, of course, uh, uh, users, uh, we all, as citizens, have to have a responsibility. And it is very important that we get empowered to acknowledge that uh, moving safely is equal to a human right. Uh, there, I have the right to go to a school, to go to work, to go to my errands without being killed on the way. Uh, this empowerment also has a double face because I, as a user, need to make sure I am moving around in the most optimal ways to protect uh, myself. And that does not mean getting yourself into a four by four <laughs> so that you are the strongest <laughs> car in, 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 on the road. Um, I have talked about governments before, and so I won't spend more time, uh, much like I won't cover the uh, infrastructure builders or the vehicle manufacturers. Uh, but what I would like to bring your attention to is that there is a lot that we can do on corporates who operate on other business sectors, uh, because they are actually, uh, they, they, many of them are bigger than most countries in the world, number one, and many of them generate mobility in their operations. And so there is a way to internalize their cost uh, in, in very um, um, strategic ways. Uh, and above it and above all, what we need is a huge shift of media reporting. It's unbelievable that at the end of this year, 2020, 1.3 million people might have died out of COVID and God bless them. And, and obviously no one wants this, but 1.3 million deaths have been happening for road crashes for the past 20 years. And no one has paid much attention, not remotely to the level that we are witnessing uh, these days. And so how media can help us shape our views and our expectations and can help empower different agents to do uh, better is, is amazing. Let me come to an end uh, because this corporate uh, uh, work is something I wanted to, to, to highlight. Um, what you have on the picture is, is a bottle of milk from Sweden. 
uh, you're buying milk and what you're getting on the margins is not just what the cow was fed with, but how many uh, CO2 particles were emitted in the production delivery uh, of this one liter of milk. And much like we are concerned about our carbon monoxide uh, footprint, I contend that we should be pushing for a road safety footprint. And that is exactly what uh, um, a so-called road safety index that we are working on is trying to address to make sure that we are um, helping chase all the uh, movement that goes on from raw material to, to, to the end of life of any of the products on our hands to ensure that they have been produced, manufactured and delivered uh, with no crash um, uh, ill consequences neither. I, I'm, I'm going to stop now because I do want to have your opinions and your views, but, but I cannot I cannot finish without uh, re emphasizing enough that if anything else uh, should be different in this decade, in the second decade, is that we also have to be clear. And a death is a death anytime and anywhere, um, that we know what works and what does not work, and that we know that manufacturing legal is not enough because we know better than legal. We know that most road safety interventions are highly cost beneficial and cost effective, even when compared to other societal interventions. So road safety is not an expense, but an investment. We know that corruption is in the air or on the road, <laughs> however you want to put it. So we must face it. And I, I, I also, we also need to be clear in that 2030 is way too late. That will be about 150 years of road carnage. Uh, and are we really ready to stand behind another 40 million deaths in the next decade, unless we act on what we know we need to act? And so can we please go back to the root of the problem? Can we please realign those ill incentives? Can we please make sure that we each pay for our own uh, um, move mobility in fair ways and can we please stop the passing the ball to the end user who not only is the vulnerable road user but also the one who we continue to blame with that said i really thank you for your attention and i very much look forward to your comments and your questions great Mary, thank you so much for a terrific uh, and passionate presentation i think uh, i would like to have you named uh, global minister of transport and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Take this on for um, for everybody. Uh, I have one question. There's some questions, and please put your questions in chat. And I see we have some already. Let me ask um, if you come and I mean, you you have a unique perspective, having been in academia, having been in government, having now worked with multiple sectors. Um, how how does do academics make a difference here, and our our research, our centers, our programs? Um, how do we play into addressing this uh, problem that you've laid out so well? Well, um, it's a difficult question. Uh, it is a difficult question because uh, the academics play a positive role and, and at times a negative role. The positive role is that uh, road safety is plagued with eminence-based advice. And we need evidence and academia is the source of evidence. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I have had to listen to things that are completely wrong, completely wrong, but they are told by an eminent character and everybody nods their head. And so academia has to be, I think the American expression would be the Jiminy Cricket. Huh? There are things that are said that are not true. On the other hand, at times, academics within road safety, and I include myself, have become very picky, very obsessive, and too much of a purist. And we have gotten to the exercise where uh, the bad perfection is an, good is an, perfection is enemy of good. You have an expression to that sort, yeah, right. meaning trying to reach perfection, we have stopped not sharing the good that we had, okay? And, and we get too obsessed with the definitions and the validities and things like that. And, and most politicians, 
they don't really care about that. They need to wrap something and run with it. And so the right balance is you have to have enough science clearly and simply explained and be consistent and be consistent throughout time. I, and I hope I've, I've answered. So it is a very important role, but a, a very difficult one. I know, one, one that would be great to have a longer discussion with. Uh, about. Absolutely. I'm gonna go through some of the questions. So uh, have, here's one from Jackie, have road safety index, indexes or similar programs been implemented by any countries or municipalities? And if so, what worked? Um, countries and municipalities tend to have statistics uh, with road crashes and fatalities and things like that. And, and, and so in a way, their, their, their uh, statistical analysis is just that of the outcomes. The road safety index is a slightly different concept. The road safety index is that of, of all the things that I do to sell you the tablet I'm talking you through, how many materials were moved from one end to another, how many people had to go to your office or your or their, uh, factory. And in, in all those transactions, mobility transactions, what did I do to ensure that there were no crashes and no victims? Uh, so I guess that eventually one could think of um, uh, a transformation of the index where cities can measure the mobility of their citizens and, 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 and work to lower uh, those uh, risk functions. At present time, I have never seen anything like that. Um, the closest thing, if, if, if I can be proud of, <laughs> well, is definitely. some work from the city of Barcelona, where there is currently very interesting work resorting the city layout with no infrastructure expense. It's mostly paint and, and, and flower pots, <laughs> uh, but they are trying to reorient the mobility patterns of the citizenship in the city of Barcelona and safety is at the heart of that uh, remodelation. But that could be, that is the only example I could uh, point to, unfortunately. So just uh, here's a question that you may be able to answer, maybe not familiar. Uh, these four ve vehicles, these all-terrain vehicles, the people, of course, drive fast and not necessarily safely. Uh, mm -hmm. what, I, I guess the question here is, um, how are they dealt with? Are they uh, dealt with separately? Um, are they included with automobiles when people look at safety? Um, um, uh, most countries um, uh, using the international definitions of um, motorized vehicles for their statistics include ATVs in, in their counts. Uh, the issue is mostly one of whether the crash occurs on a public road or not. So you, you might find differences in reporting because some of these ATVs only operate in rural lanes uh, or private uh, lands. Um, um, I don't think I have not seen, I mean, I, I think that at the global perspective, those are still a very minority issue. So I haven't really seen much um, uh, on them. But uh, this question, uh, if I can, brings me to a, a, a broader question. Uh, so you have a car and you have mandatory insurance in the US, in Spain, in many countries, not all the countries. Then you have a bike, but you don't have an insurance on the bike. Uh, some car insurances cover the bike. And then you have an ATV, and because it is a motor vehicle, you have to have an insurance <laughs> on that. And so we have this fragmented approach. Maybe a possibility is that the insurance industry rethinks their way, and what they insure is the person, regardless of the mobility mean he or she uses. And what the insurance scheme ensures is that that person behaves coherently and safely in all modes he uses. And that's, that's behind the idea I uh, tried to express before when I was thinking about the, the ill incentives that exist today in the insurance industry and how could that change if we use 
the right um, approach okay. to insurance. So uh, back to the topic we were talking about before, um, new vehicle technology advancement uh, up to self uh, driving. Um, and you know, the mm. question is, sort of what will happen? What difference will this uh, make? And will we have cars and vehicles that get to be as safe as air or rail transport? For motorized four wheel vehicles in the high income countries are already pretty safe. Uh, and I think uh, the point I showed with the slide that indicates that less than 30% of the fatalities worldwide are in four wheel vehicles speaks to that point. So yes, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, promise uh, to be even safer. Um, the question is not whether the vehicle itself is safer. The question is how the vehicle interacts with other users and whether we want more of those vehicles or whether we want more of the other vehicle uh, transportation modes. And, and yes, autonomous vehicles promise that they will detect pedestrians and cyclists and motorbikes and you name it, but, but still uh, the infrastructure for that to be the case, the connectivity for that to be the case, uh, the, 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 the capacity of all different types of users to know and relate to each other is what is to be seen and de developed and seen. And so, yes, I can see the promise becoming true. I, I, I can see a zero crash right. uh, vision with autonomous vehicles. Uh, what, what I have a harder time seeing is a zero death on the road uh, in, other, yes. <laughs> in other transportation modes. So Just as an example, COVID, COVID has forced us greatly out of public transportation in many countries right. and into private uh, motorcycles or bicycles. Um, and, 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 and that in itself is, is a big issue. And so it, it, it is a multimodality issue that we need to address uh, well. So there's a few more questions and, and none of them have short answers. Uh, but uh, one, one is a question, uh, there are many cyclists in Colorado, and uh, the question is, how much difference does uh, having the right infrastructure make? And do we have good evidence, for example, from cities like uh, Amsterdam or other places where there's good infrastructure about impact on cycling uh, deaths? And do we need infrastructure or better behavior from cyclists and, motor and drivers or? Uh, infrastructure is key. Infrastructure is key. Infrastructure is, is key. I mean, I could, I could spend the rest of my time saying infrastructure is key. It is the most key thing. Uh, not only because of infrastructure in, in the sense of the platform, but also because of the segregation, also because of the, of, of the speeds the, the infrastructure allows you to take on or not. I mean, there are so many things we can do with infrastructure that there is definitely vast amounts of evidence on how infrastructure helps move people in safer ways. And, and not only for bicyclists, uh, not long ago, a few months ago, I was really surprised to see the first ever highway developed only for motorcyclists. And I thought that was the brightest thing I had seen in a long time. Okay, because the challenge of motorcycles is not the motorcycle itself, is the mix with the bigger vehicles at higher speeds. And so infrastructure definitely is important, uh, but other things need to be taken into consideration. Speed is an important consideration. As I mentioned, I mean, yes, you can bike and you can bike at, at 50 kilometers per hour downhill or even more. Uh, that, we don't want that to happen. And you can bike uh, in beautiful weather without a helmet and still get a very serious injury. And so I look forward to being, uh, if, if there was an award that I really wish existed was the, um, uh, I won't remember the exact name, but Sue Baker always tells us the anecdote that the best award she ever got was the bad guy of the month from a motorcyclist uh, association because she was so pushy on the motorcycle helmets, 
Well, I did the same in Spain with bicyclists. I wish they had that type of an award and I, they would have given it to me <laughs> because that would have meant reaching uh, Sue's uh, passion. Uh, yeah. But all those things are important. Visibility, uh, very important. And so I'm, I'm pleased oh. to see that Colorado is so much into biking, but let's passion not override that it has to be biking yeah. on the right place. You know, actually, um, I wonder, Sue, would you like to offer any comments uh, since you're with us today? She's muted. She's muted. Um, if you un unmute, I'm just, uh, we're pleased to have a good friend and colleague from Hopkins, Sue Baker, a pioneer in injury prevention, uh, listening in. And so if you want to offer any comments, unmute and do so. Or Cindy, can you unmute, Sue? Oops. We don't have you unmuted yet. Mm -hmm. Let's see, maybe we can't get you unmuted. Um, Cindy, can you help on that by any chance? Working on it. Here we go. Oh, okay, there you are, Sue, you're unmuted. We emphasize the importance of the physical infrastructure, but there's a whole world of sort of cognitive and non-physical infrastructure we, that we struggle with that determines both the physical in infrastructure and the laws and regulations and the behaviors and so on. And I don't know whether the concept of the non-physical infrastructure might help us here. <laughs> I just passed that out as a thought that occurred to me a moment ago. Uh, uh, that, that's a very good way to put a different name for the externalities. Uh, what, 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 what I'm trying to bring to your attention is that through history, through the 140 years that we have had uh, these transportation modes, we have built a, an economic architecture of money flows. And, 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 and it is that architecture, it is that infrastructure that we also need to affect and amend because things are the way they are, not just because they are the way they are because money flows in particular directions. And yes, definitely we, we must address that infrastructure and that would takes us to the governance of uh, road transport uh, in general. We lack a universal or a global uh, transportation governance model. And I don't know that they would ma make me ever the, the minister of that, John, <laughs> following <laughs> your joke. But, but yes, 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 uh, road transport is, is an orphan uh, of any higher level um, governance structure that could put an end to those ill um, flows. Well, let me, uh, I, I, we're out of time, but I'll tell you there's two other really good comments, questions sitting here, uh, dealing with cell phone distracted driving. Uh, and um, I'm sure you put a lot of thought in that. And the other one, Carolyn posed a question, which, um, you know, again, I would have uh, thought, uh, thought of as well, which was what will be the impact as we move forward on climate change, change fuels um, and, you know, change. But I, I think those are topics for um, another, um, another day. So I mean, this has been, um, you know, I want to just thank you so much, uh, Maria, for joining us and, and Sue very, Good to see, um, very good to see you. And um, I think uh, you've raised some really uh, provocative questions. I think it would be very interesting to see what the next decade um, does bring us uh, in, in this really critical um, area. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And thank you to the um, audience for uh, joining us. So uh, stay well and happy new year to everybody. Thank you. Uh Thanks. thanks. Thanks to you. Well. And I will address Caroline's question in private, but uh, the, the short answer is yes, we have a mess in our hands unless we put things in order soon. <laughs> yeah. Lots going on. Okay. Well, goodbye all. Bye. Thanks and have a good day from Madrid. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.